He's heard it all before. You're a pastor. You're not supposed to get political. You shouldn't be talking about these issues, so just stay out of politics and stick to preaching the gospel. Life, marriage, sexuality, borders, ethnicity, these things aren't political. They're biblical. God's Word has much to say about the culture we're living in. This is Our Watch with Tim Thompson. Hey everybody, welcome to Our Watch and happy Sunday to you. I am Tim Thompson, Senior Pastor of 412 Church in Temecula Valley. Glad to be with you on this Sunday. Always love bringing God's Word into your life. Hope it's a blessing to you. It tr truly is to me. Um, with me as always, I've got Pastor Jake Porter. He is the Assistant Pastor at 412 Church in Temecula Valley. Pastor Jake, always a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, it's always great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're um, going through our Red Letter Dilemma series, talking about those red letters in the Bible. Most Bibles have those. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners what the dilemma is with that? Yeah, there's uh, people that take the approach where they say, hey, you know what, I just want to read the red letters, that's it. Just want to hear the words from Jesus, and I don't want to hear anything else. Well, that leaves you in these dilemmas. Uh, one dilemma is the fact that the entire Bible, from the first word in Genesis to the last word in Revelation, the whole thing is the Word of God. It goes beyond the red letters. Yes, those are the words that Jesus spoke, but uh, the entire Bible is the Word of God. And another dilemma is when Jesus would speak in those red letters, he would often refer to the Old Testament and often refer to other parts of, uh, of the Bible. Bible. And if we don't go and look at those parts of the Bible and go and, and read these other sections that he's referring to, well, then we uh, fail to get a comprehensive understanding of what Jesus was trying to say in the midst of the red letters. We fail to get the real context of those words that are in red. And uh, that leaves you in a dilemma if you, if you can't understand the complete context of, of what he's saying. Right. Yeah, text without context is pretext. Right. Got to make sure we get all of the counsel of God's Word. So that's what we're doing, going chronologically through the life of Christ, getting the context there. Today we are in Luke chapter 12. For those who like to follow along with us in their Bibles, definitely uh, highly recommend that. Unless you're driving, don't do that. Uh, but glad to have you guys with us today. Uh, Luke chapter 12, we preached a message on this, and we're going to listen to a very short clip of that, and then we're going to come back talk more about life today. So let's listen to this. We're talking about life, and I'll tell you, Americans, our lives are consumed with self at this point. Americans have been very self-focused. How can I get more for me? How can, how can I be taken care of? How can, I get, how can I retire well? How can I pay off my house? How can I have a lot stored up in my bank account? How can I go on my vacation? That is how, what Americans have been focused on is self. And that is not what God wants us focused on. Yeah, it certainly isn't what God wants us focused on. Not that those things are bad, uh, and those things certainly, I mean, it's a good thing to pay off your car and pay off your house and you know, live with, without debt. Those things are good. Uh, store up for retirement, good things. But it should not be the focus of our lives and it, for several reasons. But one of the main things is tomorrow isn't even promised to us. So right. you know, we, what we do know as Christians is heaven is promised to us. So we should be storing up. Uh, things on earth. And that's really our first point that I want us to know in God's Word today is that life isn't about what we can accumulate here on earth. And um, if, you, if you've if been with us a few weeks, one of the things you know, there's been this progression where at first Jesus is um, offending the scribes and the Pharisees, and then all of a sudden there's some attorneys. He's like, well, I'll go ahead and offend you attorneys as well. Uh, and now here we find ourselves in Luke 12 where he's like, well, I'm not going to just leave leave it to be those three groups. Why don't I go ahead and offend the rich people as well? And so now Jesus is going to offend the rich people. In verse 13 of Luke 12, he says, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And I, it cracks me up when somebody tells Jesus what to do. Tell, hey, Jesus, do this. And that's not not at all the approach we should have to him. But, you know, I've watched over the years. You know, I've been in ministry for over 20 years now. And I've watched a lot of families come into an inheritance, and sadly, an inheritance can it can be a, a beautiful thing, it can be a very good thing, but it can also be a very divisive thing. Uh, and I, I, I assure you it can be a good thing because God says in the Proverbs that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So definitely leaving an inheritance is good. In fact, it's one of the three ways God blesses how we make our money. You know, he ble there's only three ways biblically. It's hard work, investment, and inheritance. Yep. That's it. It's the only three ways God scripturally 
blesses our our money. Um, outside of that, you, God doesn't bless gambling. He doesn't bless the lottery. These things are are not. We shouldn't be like, Lord, I bought the ticket. Would you bless this ticket? Like that's not how it works. So, so an inheritance is good. But I've watched people who aren't Christians and they these family members fight and just divide a family. Over what? Over something that's not going to be in eternity, and yet they fight. And and sadly, I've watched family members sue each other to the point where there's nothing left. They won, but then there's nothing left to get because all the fees went to attorney fees. So, what's the point? Everybody's losing except for the attorneys. Yeah. So it, it really is. Um, it, it's hard to watch sometimes. And when you see a good Christian family. Who everybody in the family's on board with with what mom and dad or grandma and grandpa wanted to do, and and they divide it up the way they they were told, and it's a blessing to the family. So, so here you have this man saying, "Hey, make sure I'm going to get what I should get." And in verse 14, Jesus responds and says, "Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you?" So the point that Jesus is making, I, that's not why I came here to earth. I didn't come here to be the divider of your estates or 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 to to arbitrate in this type of stuff. I came here to change your heart about the inheritance. You know, Jesus, when he came the first time, he lived that life of perfection, suffered that death on the cross to make a way for us to get to heaven. And what he showed us throughout his life was that he's not so much concerned with what we do. He's concerned with who we're becoming. He's concerned with what what the condition of our heart is, and that's an important thing to, to understand about Jesus. And um, previously, he had given a warning. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, he's given another warning here in verse 15. He says to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And that right there is is the heart of the matter. Your life is not about what you have. And that is, it flies in the face of the culture that we're living in. Yeah, absolutely. That's what everybody's life seems to be about is, is you know, who are you? Well, it's based off your, your zip code and the car you drive and the toys you have and all of these things. That's what people, that, oh, I am this person because of these things. Um, and it, it's nothing about those things. It's nothing right. about what we can accumulate. And, you know, you get in the in these uh, groups where there's these battles where it's like, oh, who has the nicer car? Who has the bigger house? Who has the most amount of toys? Who has the nicest pool? All, the, all these different things that people, uh, they, they try to accumulate as if it's those things that are going to solve their problems in life. And, right. and you hear so many people where it's like, oh, well, if I just had this amount of money, well, then I, oh, I, I wouldn't have these issues. And, and they see money as a means to a solution of a problem when it's it's really not the things that we can accumulate and hold on to here on earth that are going to solve our problems. Right. Life is a, it's a spiritual battle. All of these things are, are spiritual battles that need to be dealt with and, and handled as a, as a spiritual battle. It's not about the the accumulation of our things. Right. And, you know, you've got to ask the question here um, in verse 15. If you ask a question, you like, and I asked the congregation this, I, I, I read this statement, what Jesus himself said. He said, one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And I asked the congregation, how many of you believe that? And we should be asking ourselves this. Do we actually believe God's word? Do we believe him to be right? Um, and if the thing is, if, if you do believe this, then are you living that way? Because it's not enough to just believe it. You have to take that belief and turn it into action. And you'll find that that you your focus starts to change. Now, in verse 16, he, Jesus spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And then in verse 17, it says that he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? And this is the... Uh, this is the problem a lot of Americans have right now is, is what am I going to do with all my stuff? How am I going to store up all my stuff? I have a, a cousin who uh, sold her house, her and her husband sold her house in California, moved to Texas, and they bought a house that had an eight-car garage. Eight-car garage. And I just – I heard that and I just thought, that is awesome. <laughs> How cool would it be to have an eight-car garage? And the fleshly side of Tim Thompson started thinking about, 
You know what I could put in an eight-car garage? You know how many things I could put in there? How many toys I would have? How much? How many tools I would have? A shop in there? Like I start, my brain started thinking about all this. Then I thought, man, that is horrible of me. I shouldn't be thinking like that. It's so easy for us to think that way, though, as Americans, because of the culture we're living in. And we have to pause and go, okay, do I actually believe what what God said in his word? Yeah. Yeah, it's so important that we, that like you're talking about, that we actually live that out, that that we hear it. And what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, hearing it, and we, we keep that. We actually live it out, and, right. and it does something in our lives. Yeah. Do we live our life according to those words? Right. Or do we yeah. hear it and then go throughout our week and we're accumulating more stuff. More stuff, right. Yeah, Yeah. you know, the thing is, too, you know, our life is just a vapor, God says. It's here one moment, gone the next. Um, And we have to keep that in mind because God's word continues on in Luke chapter 12, verse 18. Jesus said that this man said, I'll do this. So he's got this problem. What do I do? I've got so much stuff. I I don't have enough barns. So what do I do? Um, I'll pull down my barns and I'm going to build a greater barn. And there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Um, verse 20 says, So he is, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and does, is not rich toward God. So understand, it's not that God is saying it's bad to be rich. But the question is, what do you do with your riches, and how how do you live your life? And like I said earlier, God is not necessarily concerned with what we do. He's concerned with who we're becoming. And if if we end up having toys, it's not bad to have these things, but if it causes you to fall away from God and causes you not to – if you – if you're putting all your time and money into these toys and you never invest in the kingdom of God, there's a problem. You know, and this is what God's talking about. Um, you know, build bigger barns. I mean, this is this is this guy's idea. Okay, well, let me just build bigger barns, and then I'm just going to sit and rest and eat and drink and be merry. Not like, hey, I'm going to build my barns, and then I'm going to be a blessing to God and his kingdom and actually do some work. No, I'm going to sit back and do nothing. Yeah. That can't be the attitude. Right. Yeah, and, and like you're saying, it's not those things of themselves that are bad. But, you know, it kind of comes back to, okay, this this life is a vapor, so how am I living my life? Am I truly living it according to that, where I'm trying to do whatever I can to to glorify God with the little bit of time that I have? Or am I living the life for myself right? and, and what I can get? You know, and and you, and you talk about how things will draw us away from God. Okay, if I if I buy this and and, and I'm engaged in this, is this going to pull me away from my relationship with God or or drive me closer? You know, can I use this for God's glory or is it something that's going to draw me away? You know, and and I, I think of several people that I know where it's you know they they have all these toys and buy all these things and all of a sudden they're at church less and less and less. And not that it's bad to go on a vacation and spend time with your family, but when it pulls your family away from being involved at church, from serving at church, from from being plugged in week in and week out and making that a priority, well, that, that could potentially become a problem for some people. Right. And I've seen it time and time again, exactly like you said. You know, these people, oh, I'll just go on one vacation. We, we just got a bunch of new toys, got a bunch of dirt bikes, and and then it turns into, well, it's dirt bike season. So, well, we're every weekend we're out in the desert and and like, well, where, where, what happened to your kids' investment in the youth ministry? What happened to you serving here at the church? Oh no, we're gone. It's all, it's you know, it's that season, yeah. and that's that's a hard season for a family to be pulled away from God like that. Right. And it really does take its toll on the family. And here's what it says in First Timothy chapter six, uh, verses six through ten it says that godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their uh, their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And I want to make sure we understand the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money. Um, and it's a root, it's not the root. And that's uh, uh, much misquoted, that verse. Yeah. Many people misquote that, that you know, money is the root. Money is the root. And that's not what God's word says. But the love of money, loving money instead of loving God, is 
It's a root of all sorts of wickedness. And this is why God says you can you can't have two you can't serve two masters. You can't love God and love money. Man, what the Bible calls mammon, uh, which is money. You can't have both of those loves in your life because you're going to serve one of them. Yeah. And we were created to serve, and that is the reality. Yeah, yeah, we were created to worship. We're going right. to give it to something. Right. Is it going to the Lord or is it going to yourself and other places? Right. Um, but hey, we got to take a quick break. We got to listen to a word from our sponsors. We're going to be right back after this. We are in a free speech war. With big tech, Biden is going after independent news that doesn't lockstep with them on COVID, shots, adverse effects, and early treatments. If you value Valley News' award-winning, unbiased journalism and community coverage without a left slant, please support us by going to myvalleynews.com forward slash subscribe and sign up for $5 a month. We can do this. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Our Watch. I am Tim Thompson with Jake Porter. We're both uh, pastors over at uh, 412 Church in Temecula Valley. Um, love to have you guys out sometime if you're listening in. Um, have a lot of fun at church and love to have have them out. Uh, we're talking about life today as we're in Luke chapter 12. Um, we're Right now we're in verse 22 if you're wanting to follow along in your Bible. Well, we were talking about life, how how it's not about what you can accumulate here on earth and and why would you store up stuff if, if you could die tonight? You know, I mean, our life is but a vapor. Tomorrow isn't promised to us. You know, we got to make sure that we're storing up our, our treasures in heaven. In verse 22, it says that Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you know about your body, what you will put on, and that that's something we have to recognize as we consider life. That that yeah, it's it's not about what we can what we can accumulate, and we could you know could die right now. But another thing is our life has a very great purpose, and it's it's greater than our temporal existence. There's an eternal nature to our being, and God's saying, look, don't worry about these things. And I always tell people, worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Right. You, know, you can sit on a rocking chair and rock all day long, and yeah, you feel like you did something, but did you go anywhere? No. And that's that's really what worrying does, you know. And I and I I've been I've had people frustrated with me, and I and I have to say, the older I get, the better I am at not worrying. I used to worry all the time, you know. But but just as I have found myself, thankfully maturing in Christ, I find it very, very natural at this point to not worry about certain things that other people worry about. And when they see me not worrying, they're like, well, don't you care? Well, of course I care. I mean, we got, we got also, you know what it took for us to get into this building that we're in and all the hard work and all the, the financial, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and, uh, you know, there was times where people were like, well, don't you even care? Well, of course I care. Well, you don't seem very worried about it. I'm not. Well, why aren't you worried about it? You should be worried about it. Why should I be worried about it? It's not my problem. It's God's problem. This is his church. This is his building. He can do what he wants. And and we'll just have to give it over to him and let him be God. And it takes the the need to worry right off our shoulders. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's just it is it's all about who we're living to glorify. Is is it God or ourselves? Are we trying to take matters into our own hands and say, okay, well, I've got to do it because I want this and and go down that path? Or is it, hey, this is where God wants me, so I'm going to trust in his provision and his protection? Right. Right. You know, and, and it makes it a lot easier knowing, hey, I'm operating in the will of God. Okay, I know he's he's got me covered. However right. it's going to happen, it's going to happen according to his perfect His perfect will. Right. And, and there's some some trust that we got to have uh, in that. But, yeah, it's not about the the life here on earth really at all. Yeah. Life isn't about this life, right? So it's, it's about the eternity in heaven and and how it is that we're gonna do the right things to get there and store up our treasures in heaven and and make sure that that's where we have our our security, not not here on earth. Yeah, you know, um, it says Jesus here saying, "Don't worry about these things." You know, the things in life. What are we gonna eat? What are we gonna put on? I mean, these are necessities, right? You have to have clothes, you know, to be a yeah. decent human being. Anyways, uh, you gotta have clothes. You gotta have food. You gotta have a place to lay your head. Um, this is important. God knows these things. So he's just saying, don't worry. But I, I want to make sure that our listeners today understand this, what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying, don't plant. He's not saying, don't water. 
He's not saying don't reap a harvest. There's actually work that has to go into these things. We can't just sit back and go, well, it's God's problem. He'll just take care of everything. Right. No, he, he may take, if he, first of all, yes, he will take care of everything, but he may use you to do it. You may actually have to get up off the couch and go do something. And that it's a good thing to plant and to water and to reap. These are all good things, and God uses that. Um, but life is, after all, more than food. That's what he says in verse 23. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Yeah, there's a lot more to life than that. You know, and we, we, I, I just keep drawing back to, okay, I got to operate in the, the will of the Father. You know, okay, life is more than that. So yeah. where, where is it that God wants me? Right. If that's not what my focus should be on, then okay, God, where, where do you want my focus? And trust in his protection. Right. Well, we, you know, he goes on in verse 24. Uh, well, do me a favor, read verses uh, 24 through 28. Uh, he says, Consider the ravens, uh, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? You know, it's uh, those last words there are incredibly difficult sometimes to hear, O you of little faith. Yeah. But how many times did Jesus say that to his disciples? And think about this. These are people who saw him walk on water. These are people who saw him raise dead people back to life. These are people that saw him give sight to the blind. They saw him feed thousands of people with practically nothing. They saw him be able to provide in ways that they never thought could happen. And yet still, over and over again, Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith. This is this is the human condition. And we we you know, we we know that faith comes from God. We just need to ask him for more. And God says he'll give us if we ask. Here's a I just wanna we just have a couple minutes left and I still want to get to one more thing about life. Life is there's a purpose that's greater, obviously, outside our temporal existence. So what is that? Well, it's about the kingdom of God. And and this is something that that we should be praying for regularly, just as you know the disciples had said, show us how to how to pray. One of the things the Lord told us to pray for is for his kingdom to come and his will to be done here on earth. So yeah. we are praying for the kingdom to be here on earth. Um, it says in verse 29, do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink or have or have an anxious mind. Um, here's the thing. God doesn't want us being anxious. And what do we have in our, our society? A huge problem with anxiety. Yeah. You know, and, and trying to deal with that anxiety in several, several different ways. Might I suggest to our audience, if you're dealing with anxiety, take it to the Lord. He says, don't worry. Worry turns into anxiety. God knows that anxiety is not good for us. That's why he says, don't worry. Trust me. Have faith. Uh, for all these things, the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. God feeds the birds. He clothes the grass. He does it with great splendor. And he'll do it, if he'll do it for them, he'll do it for us. Yeah, absolutely. And he, and he says, the, the Father knows. It's not a mystery that you need food and clothing and these basic necessities. Right. You know, right. Let me just close with this, because we just have uh, just a small portion left. Let's just close with what he says here in verse 31. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. That, that's, we'll, we'll just close there. Seek the kingdom of God. You're going to have everything you need. Store up your treasures in heaven. Where, where Christ is, and all, all will be well. That's all the Amen. time we have. Pastor Jake, thanks for joining me. Yep, thanks for having me. Yeah, and I want to thank you for tuning in. We've got a new series that's going to be starting next week. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians. Love to have you join us for that. So that's all the time we have. God bless you. We'll see you next week right here on Our Watch with Tim Thompson. This has been a production of Our Watch with Tim Thompson. We hope you are encouraged to engage the culture around you. We want to invite you to connect with Pastor Tim by going to the Connect page on ourwatch.com. That's O-U-R watch.com. Until next time, 
This is all of us at Our Watch reminding you to be bold, be strong, and to take back the public square.